This is your Over the Garden Wall read and listen book. You can read along as I tell you the story. Please turn the page every time you hear the sound of the steam engine train. Are you ready? Let's begin. Somewhere lost in the clouded annals of history lies a place that few have seen, a mysterious place called the unknown, where long-forgotten stories are revealed to those who travel through the wood. On one particularly dark night, beneath an overturned half-moon, two brothers accidentally wandered deep into the fog of this strange world. Their names were Wirt and Gregory. And they had a frog who, who, uh, they, um, well, he didn't have a name yet. As the boys began to realize just how lost they were, they suddenly heard the sound of a cleaving axe echoing through the otherwise silent forest. Wirt, the elder brother, was quick to worry. Do you think it's some kind of deranged lunatic with an axe waiting out there in the darkness for innocent victims? Gregory, the younger brother, wasn't the type to be afraid of such things and immediately ran off towards the source of the noise. Greg! Greg! Luckily, the sound had come from a kindly old woodsman who was hard at work chopping down a tree into bits of kindling. Wirt and Gregory explained that they had lost their way. They didn't know where they were. The woodsman chuckled and raised an eyebrow. <laughs> Welcome to the unknown, boys. You're more lost than you realize. The woodsman, who seemed to know every inch of the forest, pointed the brothers in the right direction. Soon they were back on the path towards home. But the trail seemed to go on and on. Morning came, and they were still wandering along the same path. We should have found a town by now, said Wirt. This is the way the woodsman told us to go, right? Before Greg could answer, they heard a small voice calling to them for help from inside a bush. Help me! I'm stuck! The voice pleaded. Help me out of here and I'll owe you a favor. The voice belonged to a talking bluebird named Beatrice. Though Wirt was hesitant, Gregory thought it was a good idea to let the bird free. Upon her release, Beatrice was very grateful and promised to guide the brothers to Adelaide of the Pasture, the good woman of the woods. She could help you get home, Beatrice explained. With Beatrice to guide them, the travelers journeyed onwards, deeper and deeper into the unknown, in search of Adelaide's cottage. The first place they stumbled upon was a peculiar little town called Pottsfield, where everyone seemed to be made of vegetables. The inhabitants were celebrating the harvest season and dancing around a, a big thing. Say you folks ought to don your vegetables and celebrate the harvest with us. One of them insisted. Yeah, it's nice here. The other added. But though it seemed fun, Wirt and Greg knew they had to continue on. What they didn't know was that someone or something was following close behind them as they traveled. A figure crept out of the shadows. It was a ferocious gorilla. <laughs> they ran. Before long, they reached the schoolhouse and found it was full of animals learning to count and spell. Wirt thought that this might be a good place to take refuge from the danger outside. Greg disagreed. School? Not today. He said as he ran off into the woods. Wirt and Beatrice could do nothing but follow. Soon it began to rain, and that night even Beatrice was lost. She thought it best to stop at a creepy old tavern and ask for directions. Let's go to this creepy tavern and ask for some directions. See? But as soon as they entered, Beatrice was shooed out. No birds allowed in my tavern, shouted the tavern keeper. Now it was up to Wirt to get directions. He nervously approached the friendliest-looking denizen of the tavern, a smiling toy maker. Wirt tried to explain the situation. I was wondering if you knew the way... Um, her name is Adelaide, and... Thinking Wirt wanted romantic advice, the toy maker burst into song. Right. 
write a loving letter, boy, the swoops and sweeps and curls. Calligraphers are just a thing to help you win your girl. Then you'll need to dress up smart, the tailor's here by chance. The stitch your trousers, hold your belt, and find culture of friends. Your shoes, my goodness, how they're worn, but you're too young to know. Nothing courts a woman's scorn more than scuffs on the toe. The cobbler can attend to that, meanwhile you must have cake. The baker and patissier need work, for goodness sake. Hi, dee diddly um the dum today. What a merry time we'll have upon your wedding day. Hi, dee diddly um the dum today. There's work for old and little boys getting married. That pointy cone upon your head, you can't be wearing that. The milliner will fix you up with proper high silk hat. The bride, of course, she'll need a dress, on that we must agree. The seamstress, my young lover, oh, how grateful she will be. The rings, by gum, did I forget? Well, that's my favorite part. The vows, the whole romantic mess, now that's the jeweler's art. And so you see, your handiwork is yours if you're inclined. But our livelihood's a stake, so don't you go and change your mind. Hi, dee diddly um da dum today. What a merry time we'll have upon your wedding day. Hi, dee diddly um da dum today. There's work for all and little boys getting married. End of side one. The tavern denizens cheered and taunted Wirt for being such a romantic young man. Try as he might, Wirt could not get a word in edgewise. It seemed as if getting directions was quite a hopeless task until, as luck would have it, they met a horse named Fred. Like Beatrice, Fred the horse had been forced to stay outside in the rain. Nice to horse your acquaintance, he said, letting them ride on his back. Now, Fred was not a very smart horse, but... Actually, I'm the third smartest horse in town, all right? Okay, fine. Fred was a very knowledgeable horse and more than eager to help the brothers on their journey. Their course was almost complete when they reached a wide river. The only way across was to ride the riverboat ferry. Unfortunately, none of them had any money to buy a ticket. They were all flat broke. What could they do? They were so close to Adelaide of the pasture. They were so close to getting home, yet so far. At this point, I should just say that Wirt and Greg had been traveling for what seemed like days without ever sleeping, yet they didn't even notice. There was something strange going on. The moon was still the same upside-down moon it had been every night since they were lost. The frog, on the other hand, was tired. He decided to take a nap inside of Greg's hat. He fell into a deep, peaceful sleep. In his dreams, well... See, a frog's dreams are private. But what I'm trying to get at here is the frog didn't know what happened while he was asleep. All he knew was, it seemed their luck had run out until the gang met a millionaire who gave them the exact fare they needed to ride the ferry. Take this penny and off you go, the lot of you. He said, handing them a coin. Fred the horse said goodbye as well. He decided to stay behind and get an honest job working for the millionaire. As an official tea horse, he said, waving goodbye to his friends. Finally able to pay the fare, Wirt, Greg, and Beatrice merely climbed aboard the ferry and went on towards Adelaide's cottage. The frog, feeling quite happy, sang a song. At night when the lake is a mirror And the moon rides the waves to the shore single soul sets his voice singing content to be slightly forlorn a song rises over the lilies sweeps high to clear over the reeds and over the bulrushes swaying to pluck at a pair of heart strings two voices now they are singing then ten as the melody soars round the shimmering pond all are joining in song as it carries their reverie on over the treetops mountains over the blackened ravines then softly it falls by a house near a stream and over the garden wall tunes 
As the sun went down, they reminisced about the fun adventures they had shared. And although they would miss each other very much, they knew that they'd never forget all the wonderful memories. Or would they? What are memories? But stories of time lost forever. Fragments of a reality we will never experience again. And as one recalls these flights of fancy, we lose ourselves in the believing of false life of our own creation. Something we seem to remember but can't rationally trust to be true. And so it was with Lord McGregory and their descent ever further into the unknown. From wayward souls who wander through the darkness, there is a light for the lost and the meek. Sorrow and fear are easily Forgotten when you submit to the soil of. 